الله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have the pleasure today to have Brother Ahmed Didat with us. I suppose everybody must know Ahmed Didat. Alhamdulillah, he is a very well known da'iya. He has devoted his life for Islam. He is working for Islam in South Africa. We know the Islamic Propagation Center, which he established and working for Islam there in South Africa. But however, he's not only well known in South Africa, he's well known, alhamdulillah, all over the world. Alhamdulillah, Allah has given him the knowledge and the sensibility to understand maybe the other religion which dominates a large part of the world. Let's say Christianity. Alhamdulillah, Brother Ahmad Hidal is so knowledgeable about it than the Christians themselves. Once you are Muslim, then you have the light. You can see the truth sometimes even between the lines, even when these lines are corrupt. So Alhamdulillah, Brother Ahmad Hidal conveys the message of Islam to the Christians from their own holy book. He tells them where the faults are where the difficulties are. At the same time, he tells them that he knows this, he knows this truth because he knows the full truth revealed from Allah to our Prophet Brother Ahmed Hirat was debating recently in Albert Hall with one of the Arab Christians from Palestine. And MashaAllah, Brother Ahmed Hirat has given him the lesson to him and to everybody, if they have sins, if they make sins, the light is clear for everybody to see, but he needs to have the eyes in order to see that light. So those people, after Brother Ahmed did that, talk to them, if they deny the truth any further, they just want to deny it, although they see it. Brother Ahmed did that, inshallah, is going to talk to us today. I believe all of all of us here are young du'a. We hope, inshallah, one day we will devote more time for da'wah. So, Brother Ahmed Didat has got a message for us to convey. And, inshallah, he's going to talk about Christmas. I asked him why. <laughs> <laughs> so, I asked Brother Ahmed that the team of the conference is going to talk to the Muslims in the West, the way ahead. He said, no, it's going to be, the talk time is going to be Christmas. So I said, well, oh, inshallah. <laughs> All right. So inshallah, I leave you to, I leave you to Brother Ahmed that to talk to you about Christmas. The few blackest Muslims in the West, the way ahead. <laughs> قالت ربي أن يكون لي ولد ولم ينصر في باشا قال كذلك الله يحب ما يشاء إذا قضى أمرا فإنما يقول له كن فيقول صدق الله صدق الله في الرزيق Mr. Chairman and my dear children I know that topic that has been announced to you is quite an amusing topic that coming to a Muslim conference of young men and women and talking about Christmas, has anything gone wrong with Uncle Gita? It's not right in his head. <laughs> but I don't think that anything has gone wrong yet. You see, last Friday, I was at the East London Mosque. And um, there were a lot of young boys and girls, Westerners, Christians, white people. They were visiting the masjid in East London, the one right on the main road, some chapel road or something like that. It was a big masjid. And uh, after showing them around, the guy took, him, took them to a small room and he was going to answer their questions. 
So they invited me, and one of the questions that the students, the Christian, asked, do you Muslims celebrate Christmas? So I said yes, and I said no. I said yes, in the sense that Christmas is a public holiday. <laughs> Like in my country, always around Christmas time, our oldest holiday we have. Christmas Day, Boxing Day, and then some other days towards the weekend. We have our four days holiday ever, almost every year. So, as is an occasion for us, we we'll go and arrange our weddings, meet our friends, our relations, and we have a jolly good time. Not like you think drinking and dancing, but in an innocent way, we have a good time. Thank you very much for giving us these four days. It was our goal to do that. So from that angle, I said, we do celebrate Christmas. But we do not commemorate the birthday of Jesus on this day, on the 25th of December. Because, we said, Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. If we knew his exact date of birth, as we commemorate Mila, the birthday of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I said, why should we not? Celebrate the birthday of Jesus. Don't we believe in him? Don't we? We do. Why are you afraid to say yes? <laughs> we do believe in Jesus Christ as one of the mightiest messengers of God, as the Messiah, the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe in his many miracles, including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission, of healing those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. If you say you don't believe in Jesus, you are not a Muslim. So, since we believe in him, and if you knew his date of birth, why should we not commemorate Christmas, the birth of Christ? But since the 25th of December is not his birthday, it is actually the birthday of the pagan god. See, the sun god, not the son of God in inverted commas. It is the birth of the sun god. I said, you see, according to the Quran and the Bible, Jesus Christ was not born on the 25th of December. According to the Quran and the Bible. In the Bible we are told that when Jesus was born, the shepherds were out in the field with their flocks at night. And Palestine is in the northern hemisphere. In winter, in midwinter, 25th of December, it is as cold as Mary England. So, if the shepherds were out in the field in midwinter, like this, in the field, the shepherds would freeze to death and the sheep would freeze to death. <laughs> So, if the shepherds were out in the field, it could not have been in December, number one. Number two, the Holy Quran tells us that when Jesus was born, Mary, his mother, she had retired to a remote place in the east. And when the child was born, the voice was heard, telling her that there is a river here, wash yourself, refresh yourself, and get hold of a palm leaf, and pull towards herself, and shake it, and it will let fall, fresh, ripe dates. Dates, hajju. It will let fall. So, when will you have fresh, ripe dates on palm trees that you can shake and laugh? In summer, mid-summer, not mid-winter. <laughs> so, from the Islamic authority, we know it could not be December. And with the Christian authority, we know that it was not December. So, you are commemorating the birth of a sun god, not the son of God. See the primitive man. In this northern region, in the Mediterranean regions, as winter approached, you could see the sun going backward and backward in the southern hemisphere, receding from them, receding. And day by day it started getting colder and colder. 20th of December, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, it's getting colder and colder. And they personified this as the devil trying to swallow the sun. The happenings in the heavens, astronomically, that the devil was swallowing the sun, and by the twenty fifth, they felt they would see the primitive man. They would see every little different variation in temperature. They would feel and relate to some other happening. You see, you see now the, uh, the the prince of darkness, the devil, has been overcome by the sun, and the sun is reborn. It is born again. The sun. Coming back into its own 25th, 26th, 27th, getting warmer and warmer and warmer. So 25th of December was the turn of the tide in the heavens. So the sun is being born. Sun, the sun, 
Not a son of God. So this is the pagan holiday. The pagans had a holiday. And since the Christians came on the scene, they saw that these people were commemorating around that day. So they adopted that day and they started celebrating Christmas. If we really knew, I said we would have no hesitation in commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ. But 25th of December is not. I read this verse to you from the Holy Quran, from Surah Ali Mirat, chapter 3, verse 47. Where when the good news was given to Maryam about the birth of the Holy Son, she said, قَالَتْ رَبِّ أَنَّ وَلَمْ يَمْسَسْتِ بَشَرْ She says, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? So the angel says in reply, قَالَتْ رَبِّ أَنَّ يَكُنُّهُ مَا يَشَا Even so, Allah prays what He wills. إِذَا قَدَا أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ So whenever the decrees are matter, He merely says to it, be and it is. This is the most important set of the Buddha of Jesus. This is... You know that the good news was given and Mary carried the child for nine months according to this Bashara uh, and the child was born. Now, there is an eternal confrontation between the Muslims and the Christians. Allah Ta'ala reminds us about this. In the Holy Quran, it says, tarda anka yahudu walan nasara hatta tattabiya billah That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslim. Unless you follow the brand of religion. Either you ask out, if you want peace, become Christian. Or change them. It's one of the, there is no satisfaction otherwise. You want to become a Jew or a Christian, the Jew says, you follow. For example, religious, if the Jews have been thrown in the power, they are not prepared to convert you. They don't want anybody other than the Jew. They have made the religion a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They only want political recognition. You recognize that they are entitled to Palestine and there's peace with them if you want peace that way. Give in. Give in. He says, look, Palestine is first. The great grandfathers even had it at one time, and they are come to take back their inheritance if you want peace with them. They say, this is the only thing they want now. Political recognition. They don't want to convert you. You are Gentiles. In Hebrew, Goyim means filthy, dirty, unclean people, impure people. They don't want you. Keep out. Keep out. Judaism is a racial preserve. The Christian is knocking at our door. And he is making life miserable for our people all over the world. There are at the present moment 42,000 American crusaders in the world. Americans alone. Out of the world, 70,000 missionaries, not priests, pastors, or ministers of the church. No. These are the crusaders. There are. 70,000 out of whom 42,000, 60% are Americans. And they're raising the dust throughout the world. In Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Indonesia, in Africa, wherever they look, they're raising the dust. Telling us that we Muslims are going to hell. There is only one way for you to go to heaven is they say, Allah tells us, وَقَالُوا And they say, لَنْ يَدْبُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ عَبُدَنَا مَسَارًا That you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There is no heaven for you. إِلَّا Except, مَنْ كَانَ عَبُدَنَا مَسَارًا Unless you become Jew, or unless you become the Christian. In answer to that, Allah says, تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ That this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. Fully tell them, ha, to Burhan. Produce your evidence, your proof. Your certificate that entitles you to Jannah and destines us to Jannah to hell. Let's have a look at the certificate. Full heart in the in the truth. If you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof. Your certificate. And they have produced it. The certificate in 2,000 different languages. The Bible. Says that my Bible says this, my Bible says that. My Bible says this, my Bible says that. You want to solve it? This is proof. Allah says, when Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that the proof is produced, you will be able to analyze it. Otherwise, it makes no sense. So they have produced the proof, 
and they're presenting through the Bible, knocking at our doors, telling us that we're going to hell. In our own homes, they eat our, they drink our tea, they eat our samosas and our bhajas and our kusistas and our jalebis, and they're sending us to hell. And we are setting targets, setting ducks for these people because we have no knowledge of how to give battle, how to defend yourself. We have no knowledge. We are good Muslims, maybe. You know, we know how to pray, we know how to make wudu, how many sunnah, how many nafil, how many wajib in the wudu, in the that we know. We know what said, uh, the length of the beard, how long it should, should be, whether the mustache should be shaved or trimmed, that we know, all that we know. But we don't know how to give battles to this guy who's knocking at our door, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Dutch Reformed Churches, the Seventh-day Adventists, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Methodists, they're all trying to make inroads into the community. And your presence here in this country, most of you seem to be like foreign. You are not all British. Yet. Maybe half a dozen of you might be born there. But the bulk of you coming from Malaysia, Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, wherever, we are all foreigners in this country. And you are making their mouths water. You, you, you. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Huh? You think I'm joking? You see? These are the publications. I don't know whether you have come across that. Islam comes to Britain. Beautiful production. Beautiful. This is a picture of the Regent Park Mosque, the central mosque in London. I showed it this to Dr. Mohan, the director. I said, you see this? Islam comes to Britain. He said, that's our mosque. I said, yes, but you didn't bring it. You didn't bring this. I said, it's a Christian thing. I said, what for? They are trying to terrify the people that Islam is coming to Britain. Now these people are going to make inroads into our society, do something, change them before they change us. Before we change them, they must change us. Then the Canadians from Canada, they had a society, a body called International Crusaders. Crusaders, you know the Mujahid of Crusaders. We will about die, 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 and we will go and deliver the message. They are crusaders. They want to do crusades. In early days, they had the crusade, you know, we fought it out with them. But now, there's another type of intellectual crusade. They want to wage against our people. And they have come all the way from Canada, and they made their headquarters in Birmingham. Why Birmingham? I didn't know. You see, about three or four times, twice or thrice, I had come here before. Where this you didn't make. And women. I didn't know at that time that Birmingham was the center of England, more or less. And it was the second largest city in the UK. That also I didn't know. So they, they have transported the, the this thing, headquarters to Birmingham. And Birmingham, they're saying something here. So what is making the mouth water? You know, you make your mouth water when you're very hungry and you smell burning meat. What happens to you? You know, your mouth starts watering when you're hungry. So it's making the Christian's mouth water. It says here, yeah, our strategy, the strategy of the International Crusaders. So our goal is to field an English-speaking team to Birmingham to work amidst the 25,000 Bengali Muslims. At least. Bengali Muslims, 25,000. I don't know that so many Bengali Muslims in Birmingham. So they say, and there will be other Pakistanis and Hindustanis and Malaysians and all in Birmingham. Expatriates, people who have come to eat out a living, poor people, illiterate people, ignorant people. They are Muslims by name, bulk of us. So, is the God is God's an opportunity for them. They change their title from international crusaders to international teams. So you might be kept part of that. If there's a crusaders, ah, this once more again. You know the old story comes to mind. They say, no, 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 no. So they change the title to team, international team. They no longer put. They tell you why they change it. How to catch the fish. They know that the fish is easy to catch as a team, international team. Maybe football team, maybe tennis team, maybe what? The basketball team. Team. Or the team. team. But no more crusaders. And they're knocking at our door. And they're telling the people, look, we are very fortunate in this day and age. These people
people are coming to our doors. These students, these laborers, these businessmen, they are coming to our doors, to our country. So it's making our task easy for us. Three years, prior to this, prior to 50 years. He says, you know, we have to go to their countries, in the East, in the Orient. We have to go to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to India, to Pakistan, Bangladesh. These names didn't exist, but those territories, you know what we are talking about. Thousands of miles away from home. Away from the home base. Now, we can work from the home base. We can sleep with our wife and children. And in the morning, we can get out and we find the customers around us. They can come over and they can work till late in the evening and back home in the evening they can sleep with the wife and children. Prior, prior to this, thousand, five thousand miles away, ten thousand miles away, away from the home base. Now they can go and work from the home base. You make that easy for him. Number two, he said, culturally, these people, they're backward people. You know when we went to Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh, when we went to village. The guy welcomes us, but he has to sit on the floor on the grass mat. The flies are buzzing all around. And the smoke is coming from the kitchen, the stove, you know, the open stove. And we're smarting our eyes. The eye is watering, the nose is watering. And we have to talk to the fellow. No more, no more. Culturally, this guy is prepared to receive us with your sofa and kursi. Huh? And your dining room table and the chairs. You can give them tea and cakes. Or sitting. No more on the ground. Culturally, you are now prepared to receive the message. Number two. Number three, he said, previously, we had to learn the language of the natives. Wherever we went, we went to Bangladesh. We must learn Bengali to talk to the Bengali. When we went to Indonesia, we had to learn Indonesian to talk to the Indonesian. When we went to Northwest, we had to learn Pushtu to talk to the Pathan. When we went to the other part, we had to learn Urdu. Wherever we went, we had to learn the language of the natives. No more. These guys, they are now learning our language. Aren't you? You can't do without that. You have to learn his language. So we are already prepared to receive the message. He doesn't have to learn your language. You have already learned his. Linguistically, you are not prepared to receive the message. No? Number four. He said, previously, if we converted an individual in any villages, in any of these countries, name, he becomes a sore of thumb in the community. Everybody sees him and says, that Hadith, that when there is an apostate, murda, tafir. You know, you feel like strangling him, no? Your own brother, your cousin, your nephew, your relation, he's become a murda, a tafir. How do you feel? So you feel like it. And the whole, whole community, the whole community, the village, the town, everybody is activated against him. You don't like him, you don't want to see him, you want to kill him, murder him. You feel it, your child is lost. When you go to hell now, he's become an apostate. He's not cursing, abusing, and swearing over the me. How do you feel? But now, no more. We have 60 million. And in the 60 million, we can easily absorb these guys now. You, 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 you. Easily absorb it. Solid one. Number five. So previously, the government, or even now, the government, they can do nothing about it. But they're not happy. Because they are creating a potential fifth column in our midst. In Pakistan, in the Punjab, there are certain places in the Punjab where they have, the, the Christians are in the majority. They have converted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. They have converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous hundred years of British rule. Fifteen million Indonesians have been converted already into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Indonesia a Christian nation. And there's every chance that it's going to happen. The way things are moving. Everything is in the favor of the Christians. It's a loaded thing against the Muslims. We were boasting at one time, we are the biggest country, Muslim country in the world, the biggest Islamic Muslim population in the world, Indonesia. I said, not what happens today, not what happens. Your 100 million, 140 million is rubbish. Ready like grass, cut and ready to be burnt. 140 million, not what happens. This is what has happened. So, but the government, like in Pakistan, is not happy. 
So, yeah, yeah, what was the Zian, Zia, General Zia, he can do nothing. I don't know who's ruling in Bangladesh, but who can do nothing to the missionaries. But in his heart of heart, they are not happy. But here, change the people, convert them, and the government is happy, absorb them. All this, let them come, when they come, absorb them. We can make them look blind, we have bigger market for our wine industry. We have more big eaters from now on. We have more fabulous, more promiscuous people. You know? so, yeah, we want to make them all of our own. It can happen. We really need it. Things do happen. When you tie a horse to a donkey, we are told. When you tie a horse to the donkey, the horse can't bray like a donkey. But we have a saying that it lifts up his head. It tries to imitate the donkey. That horse is weak. You know, try to imitate like a wife, try to behave like him. You know, the standards are known. Oh, this is, this is going to make them one deeper. So, five points against us because of you here. Yeah. You don't have to learn your language, culturally, from every point of view. Ah, you are ready for housing. So, what are we to do? You can't isolate yourself, you can't insulate yourself. You say, no, no, no. You want to you know, keep out, nobody can approach it. No, no. You can't help it in the university. It's in your politics, in your homes. The guy comes and knocks at your door. You can't say, foot side, get away, rubbish, I don't want to talk to you. No, you say, I, I can defend myself. And our sisters also say, no, we know Islam is in the right and we can defend ourselves. Against what? You see, previously, these people, they had some systems of attacking Islam and the whole problem. That Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told me why. He spreads the religion at the point of the sword. It means he forced Islam down people's throats. If you don't accept Islam, chop off your head. They said the Quran was copied by our Nabi from the Jews and the Christians. This was the type of thing that they did. And he didn't gather much money. No controversy. They have changed their tactics, different, different tactics. Today now, they have learned new methods. Now they come to you. This is what's happening in my country, I'm sure. They're trying the same things with you here because they plan, master plans, how to do the job, tawa. Now they come to us. This is, you know, Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. How do you respond? What do you say? He said, yes, he did. He was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He says, you know, Jesus was the Masih, the Messiah. Masihullah translated Christ. Christ is a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, Arabic Masih. So Jesus is the Masih of Allah, is Allah's Messiah, Masih. What do you say? What do you say? Do you agree? Yeah. Of course. You can't say no, Allah says so. Masih is the son of Maryam. Masih Jesus, the son of Mary. You can't say no. So it's a, you know, Jesus is Masih of Allah. You say yes. Is Muhammad Masih Allah? Is he? You say no, he's Rasulullah. He said, look, Jesus is also Rasulullah. He's Masihullah and Rasulullah. Your prophet is only Rasulullah. So in your mind, do you feel now he's inferior to Jesus? No, this is the night. He's only talking to you. I'm telling you, Jesus is Masihullah and your prophet is Rasulullah. Right? Right. So, Jesus is Rasul and Masih. Your prophet is only Rasul. That's something there. This is, you know, Jesus Christ was born miraculously, without any male intervention. The ayah I quoted to you just now, the beginning. He said, no, 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 we believe that. That he was born without any human intervention. He was born so. Was Muhammad so born? Was he? No, I'm telling you, was he born without a father? No. no. So, did you see? Jesus is superior to Muhammad. Was that born like anybody else? Our Jesus was born without a father. So his father is God. Somebody you must have a father. If you haven't got an earthly father, you've got a heavenly father. Something there. He says, you know Jesus. He gave back to the dead. What do you say? Yes. Yes. Did Muhammad give life to the dead? No. You said, well, Jesus gave by God's permission. Did Muhammad give life to the dead by God's permission? Did he? He said, not that I know. I don't know. Maybe I don't know the hadith so well. Where is your prophet Muhammad now? He says that he's buried in Madinah. 
So perhaps his bones are rotten in the grave? Say, no, we believe it's Hayatul Nabi, the living Prophet. Yeah, yeah. Metaphysically. But physically, maybe? He says, maybe. Where is Jesus? He's just in heaven. He's coming back. He says, yes. He says, hey, God must have that purpose in doing that. Don't you think so? When you make Kurbani, you don't sacrifice the animal. Bakri, you call it. Huh? You look for an animal without blemish. Horns not broken. You are not cut. Not blind. Not limping. No. Perfect animal. Is that what you look for? Sheep, goat, or cow, or camel. Huh? So if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice for this creation, to redeem mankind from their sins, would he look for second best? Would he look for that? Would he? No. No, he would look for second best. Would he? Do you look for second best? Sheep, goat, cow. No. Why would God look for second best? Oh, argue. Argue and debate. Argue with the girl. You'll come out second best. Do you know why? Because this is not your field. The Ali is not his field. We don't blame him. See, he never did this proper thing. He has been learning things. What are they learning is teaching you about the Salat, Sunnah, Wajib, Nafil, how miracles and this and how and how you stand and how you don't. Everything he can tell you. That's what he studied and he teaches you that. Perfect. Beautiful. But he didn't learn this. Now find the answers. Right? Go on, look for answers. He doesn't want answers. This is what he's telling you. And we're using our children. In South Africa, it must be happening here too. In my country, for every one boy we are losing, we are losing three girls to Christianity. Find answers. Now you'll get the answer. I don't want to give it to you, know, like you know, marshmallow in your mouth, let's put it in your mouth. You know, let's put this nice sweet meat for me. Meat. Sweet meat, you know, the Pakistani meat. Let's put it nice and soft. Let's put it in your mouth and melt it in your mouth. Like Turkish delight. You know, halwa, halwa. Let's go. You want to put it in your mouth? I know you all like it. Everybody likes it. You want a little injection and say, nah, your job is done. The last few for a year at least. No. I want you to earn that. There is a book. That book is Christ in Islam. Christ in Islam. Absolutely free. Absolutely free to Muslims as well as non-Muslims. Christ in Islam. Have you got them ready? Yes. You get them from Birmingham, number 20 Green Lane, you have established Islamic Propagation Center International, you start from Durban, you got a branch here in Birmingham, and the book is available. You get all the answers there. I know you like me to put the lucky in your mouth now. But no, you have to learn to earn things. You know, you're getting things too easy. The Muslim is getting things too easy. We offer you the Quran. The Holy Quran. This encyclopedia of nearly 2,000 pages, actually 1,920 pages, with Arabic text, translation, and commentary, with a comprehensive index, five pound. Five pound. There is no book in the UK you can buy an encyclopedia of this magnitude for five pound. You get it. This is everything on your fingertips. What do you want to know about Islam, about Jesus, about well, Jay, everything about Jesus? You want to know about marriage, you want to know about divorce, you want to know about heaven, you want to know about hell. What do you want to know? You want to know about creation. In this age when everybody is talking about the theory of evolution, so where do we stand? What does the Quran say? Open up creation, creation of man, creation of heaven and earth. Read it, what Allah says. Everything on your fingertips. And how much? Five pounds. I know in my country I offer it to you. That if you can't afford it, do your child. If you can't afford it, write and tell us why we should give you one for nothing. But in Britain, I can't imagine people here, they say they can't afford it. A man wrote to me, to South Africa, and he cried to me. You know what he said? He said, I'm unemployed, and I've got half a dozen children, and I can't afford the Quran. And I felt pity for the man, my heart bled for him. Then I realized all of a sudden that these guys are living on the road, and the more children have, more income you get. <laughs> and I remember that I went to my people a few of years back when I came. I went to Preston, I went to Bolton, and my people, people coming from my village in India, speaking my mother tongue, relations of mine, they take me home, and they will feed me, they will give me tea and cakes. And I'm asking in my language, Islamata, what are you doing? 
They don't know how to speak Brothers. What do you do? Sir, I am right. You know, it's so hard for me to eat his food, drink his tea. That means I'm, I'm poor man, poor man, unemployed. I'm eating his food, good food at that, and tea and cakes everywhere I go. What you doing? He's unemployed. What you doing? Unemployed. Ooh, how horrible. <laughs> then my brother sent me, I said, man, I don't like this people, people feeding me like this. Me every, I don't do everything. He said, no, 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 Mota is calling me big brother. He said, don't worry, you know, on this door, we are able to send money, and I'm running that car also. On the door. <laughs> More children we have, the more money you get. Don't, don't tell me you can't afford it here. In my country, I don't give people, they can't afford it here. But you don't tell me you can't afford it. So, I think, you know, I can entertain these people. Actually, I know you like to entertain. And every time I come here, I know the young people, they really, you know, they say, ah, Dr. Pisa is here, you can give us some entertainment. <laughs> I would rather stop here at this juncture and allow you, my children, to ask questions. If you have any, say, look, man, this guy talks like this, that fellow says that, how do we meet? This objection of his God Islam or his attack on Islam, how do we defend ourselves? I feel that I would be happier doing that on this occasion of Christmas, about Christmas. How you can take advantage of every little thing. Easter comes along, talk about crucifixion, this is you know what's the occasion. Talk about that. Christmas comes along, the birth of Jesus. Start talking to him about Christmas. He wants to know about Christmas. Whether we celebrate, he says, look, man, like this, like that. But you know how Christmas came about? Brainwashing. Programming him. Telling him that this is a pagan holiday, man. If it was the birth of Jesus, we would have been one with you. <laughs> you know, Christ was not born. Like, pass it on, pass it on. In all innocence and the guys of entertainment. <laughs> I prefer my children to stand up and put the questions. That those people will be given the first part. I tell you why. You have to acquire the ability to stand up and speak. Because I have found in the Malaysian hall here in London, they invited me to deliver a lecture. At the end of the lecture, question time, no question, only from Christians. They stood up and asked questions. The Malay Muslim, no question. But when they said, now you can put it in writing, there was a flood. There was a flood of things. Yes. Why? Now you remain like that, like dumb creatures. Stand up and speak, man. Make a fool of yourself in public. One day, inshallah, you'll be able to do a better job. Stand up and put this tough question. My sisters, I don't mind this any notes, but you people, come on, get up and ask questions. Acquire that ability. Yes. <laughs> inshallah, we're going to get used to the old wine, inshallah. So we we'll start away, we we'll start straight away. The questions and the answers. So inshallah, I'll wait for some questions from the sisters to come on tables. I'll, I'll put these here now. So inshallah, I'll try to make some sort of balance between one question from the brothers and from this, the sisters. So inshallah, who would like to ask question? Yes, yeah. Uh, how can we speak to the atheists who don't believe in any book or who, who, who do not like, uh, consider our holy book Quran or saying it's silly? I will repeat that question in case people at the back might not have heard my son there. How do we speak to the atheists when the guy doesn't believe in God, he doesn't when you book nothing, how do you speak to him? Well, you know, to me it's very easy. And I can tell you it's also very easy. He is the best customer. The atheist, the agnostic, is a better customer than the Hindu, the Jew, or the Christian. You know, actually, from the religious point of view, a person who says he doesn't believe in God, he says he's a kafir. 
And he's supposed to be the furthest, furthest away from us. But in modern times, when a the father tells you he's an atheist or he's an agnostic, I say he is the best customer. I will tell you why. You see, I, I discovered this in the Holy Quran. Allah Ta'ala wants us to find common cause, common grounds between yourself and your recipient of your message. Like, for example, Allah says, Pull, tell her. Ya Ahlal Kitab, O people of the book, Ta'ala, come. Ila karimatin sawa in bainana wa bainakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And this is the secret with anybody. In the first instance with the Jews and the Christians, find common cause, common grounds to start off with from. And with them, Allah says, what to start with? So number one, Allah na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Because they already believe that they worship in God. They believe in Allah. So like, Let's worship the one and only God. Walla mushrika bihi shaykhan and that we associate no partners with him. And that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Common ground. Find common cause, common grounds. Common grounds. Common grounds. Common grounds. Anybody, everybody. How do you find common grounds with atheists? The man says he doesn't believe in God, and you say, yes, also, I don't believe in God. <laughs> I said, yes. What? <coughs> you see, when a man tells me that, that he is an atheist, I don't believe in God, I say, congratulations. If you tell me, if I ask you, what are you? You say, I'm a Muslim. No congratulations. You know why? Because your father was a Muslim, your mother was a Muslim. This young fellow, he says he's a Christian. No congratulations to him. Because his father was a Christian, his mother was a Christian. Can you see? But when the guy says he's an atheist, I say congratulations. Why? Because he's been thinking. Well, how did he reach that stage to say there is no God? His background. Where does he come from? He comes from his background is Christianity, his Bible, his book. And he's been reading the book, he's heard from his environment the concept of God. In the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, he has been reading, but he has been told, he has heard in Sunday school, that God Almighty made Adam and Eve, and he put them in the garden with instructions, eat of the plentiful things here, herein, except the tree in the midst of the garden, that tree, that fruit thou shalt not eat, because the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die, and shaitan. The devil makes his face seen into them, tempts them, and they act. And when they act, according to the Bible, they were eating from the tree of knowledge. So, knowledge came to them, they realized that they were naked. Prior to that, they were in a state of felicity. In a sense, they didn't know that they were naked. Now they started plucking leaves, putting it on themselves, says the Bible. And Adam heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, in the evening period, he hears footsteps. You know the earth must be shaking. This mighty King Kong, you know, millions and millions of times bigger than man, walking in the garden, Adam heard the footsteps, so he hides himself away in the bushes. So God comes and stands. I'm only reading the Bible, his Bible, which he has been reading which had brought him to this atheism. How did he come there? I'm showing you how he came there. I know, his background. So, God comes and stands where Adam was a few seconds before, and he shouts, Adam, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> Poor God, he didn't know where Adam was. <laughs> or maybe he was playing hide and seek. <laughs> you know, I play with my grandson, my grandson, little fellow, about two and a half year old. When I go home, he's there. And I shout, raise, raise, that's his name. Raise to Kache, where are you? And he's laughing. <laughs> Grandpa can't see. <laughs> like him, Unless Allah also, you know, he wants to have a little change. In the monotony of being alone. <laughs> so, so Adam, Adam, where are thou? So Adam peeps through the bushes. And she wish it, she wish it. He said, if you behave like that, you have been a Christian, you must have done something wrong. Why do you behave like that? So Adam says, it is not me, it is the woman that thou gave us to me, she made me to eat. In other words, if you didn't give me that woman, I would be in trouble. But 
Je ne pas de me plaire. Pas de me plaire pour nous. Je ne veux pas de me plaire. Et la femme qui a donné ça à moi, elle m'a donné ça. Et la femme, elle m'a donné ça à moi. Elle m'a donné ça à moi. Elle m'a donné ça à moi. Vous savez, vous avez une prédiction. Elle m'a donné ça à moi. He's an anthropomorphic god, a god of our own pattern. Then further down, you read about Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Moses. He says, oh Lord, I want to see you. In the Quran, Allah says, Lam tarani, you shall never see me. In the Bible, he's persistent. He says, I love you so much, I want to see you. Show yourself to me. That's stubborn. That's stubborn children. Sometimes you give it to them. So Allah writes, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, in the Bible. He says, all right. You know, as I'll put you between two rocks, big rocks, and in the opening he puts his hand. And he turns his back and he takes away his hand. And Moses saw the back of God, his backside. As the friend was to him, he might have been to Moses. So he shows him his backside. And God has got a backside, he's got a front side. No? If you've got a backside, then you've got a front side. If you've got a front side and a backside, you've got a top side and a bottom side. No? Reason, watch it. You must watch it. Reason. If you are a top side and a bottom side, then you are located somewhere. If you are located somewhere, I have a right to demand when you see him. And if I don't see him, I have a right to deny him. Look, this is logic. Simple reasoning. So Gagarin, the Russian astronaut, when he returned from orbit, you know, he went round and round and round, around, the first guy to go round and round the earth so many times, and he came back, and newspapers of the world carried banner headlines. In my country especially, from one end of the newspaper to the other, he says, where is your God? Where are your angels? Question mark. Okay. You want to know, where is your God? Where are these angels you're talking about? Millions of them. Where are they? So I drew an attention of a Christian missionary who was visiting me at the time. I said, look what Gagarin is asking. So he said, he's a fool. Who? Gagarin is a fool. I said, no, he's not a fool. You are a fool. <laughs> it is a concept you gave him. You gave him a concept of God that is old father Christmas. Santa Claus, sitting on some steps with his, dad, with his feet, dangling onto the other his footstool. The heaven is his canopy, the loving father in heaven. Millions and millions of times bigger than man, but something like a man. That is the concept you gave him. And angels were beautiful women with wings, well proportioned, 36, 24, 36. You know? <laughs> well proportioned with wings. And that is the concept you gave him. And today, because he can't see, he denies them. You blame him? No. That person. That Asian, that agnostic has taken the first step in the path of Islam towards Islam. The very first words of the kalima that we have to utter. If you convert somebody, what do you say? Start. How? Salaha ilaha. Don't you start with la? La, you are the first word of the kalima. La, what is la? No, ilaha. God, there is no God. Don't you say that? Can you become a Muslim without that? He's taken the first step. He says, La ilaha. He said that, meaning to say, Ila Allah. That's all. <laughs> Look, when he says, La ilaha, what ilaha? He said that one who walked in the garden, does he believe? He says, no. I'm asking, do you believe in that God who walked in the garden in the midst of the day? Do you believe in him? That there is such a God who plays hide and seek with his creation? Do you believe in a God like that? Do you believe in a God that Moses could see his backside? Do you believe in a God like that? You also say the same thing. What are you saying? You're saying that. So congratulate him. He said, congratulations. He said, look, the reason why you're thinking that like that is just great, man. You have discovered the truth. He said, these are not Ilaha. Rama is not God. Krishna is not God. Jesus is not God. The one who walked in the garden is not God. He said, La Ilaha. There are no Ilaha. There are no gods. Then you do to be loved by the deities. And you start reasoning with him. He has taken the first step, my son. Congratulate him. Right. Whatever you say. <laughs> one, one point. This is what he's making about the color. There is no color in Islam. Why the reference to white man? There are no white. Uh, there are many white Muslims. So this is a commitment which, inshallah, you you elaborate on all. You see, I have an old man of 68. I can't remember all these things in my head. Let me finish it off. <laughs> I think, you see, you must understand my problem. I am coming from an environment 
which is color conscious. Everything is color, color, color. South Africa, we are all divided into color. And I don't know in what context I mentioned white. White in the sense that the people feel that they're superior because of the color, the European. In my country, in South Africa, we feel inferior to them. In India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, wherever you are, we subject people, the white man, the white man, the European, he ruled the Indonesians for 300 years. How would you feel? Inferior. A handful of them ruled India for 100 years, a handful of them. We had so many million, 300 million at that time, and a handful of white rulers, how do you feel? So, from that point of view, the guy who's a Christian, he's invariably the guy who comes and knocks at your door. In my country, it's not the Negro, not the African, it's not the other Indian, it's not the colored, it's the white man, the European. I'm not talking as a racist. I know, in the sight of Allah, the only standard given to us in the Holy Quran is inna akaranakum in the Mayaqtab. So most certainly the noblest in the sight of Allah is he who is the best in conduct. Not black or white, not rich or poor, not European or Asiatic, the best in conduct. But you must understand in the context of what we are talking, I'm not saying that no white man can be a Muslim. We have our Muslim brothers and we are happy to have them with us. But I'm not talking in the racial, racial terms. I just asked the question, that was just to clarify the point of color. So I hope inshallah it is clear now. So how can a Muslim justify another prophet after Isa alayhi salam? Because people would say, we believe in Jesus, which we appoint him, but why should we believe in the Rasul alayhi salam? Very, very easy to justify. This is what Jesus said. Jesus himself Put the words into his mouth. In the Holy Quran, we are told, "Wa mubashiran bi Rasulin yati min baadi sunu Ahmad." He said, "He gave glad tidings of the Prophet to come after him, whose name shall be Ahmad, which is another name for Muhammad." But in the Bible, in his own Bible, Jesus says, "I have yet many things to say unto you." But he cannot bear them now. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 16, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How big? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will come into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things he shall be here, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. So he's talking about somebody else who's going to come after him, who will guide mankind into all truth. Who is that Spirit of truth? They said the Holy Ghost. I said, now, nah, what did the Holy Ghost teach you in 2000 years? Any church, give me one new thing. I said, you see, in English, when he said, I have yet many things to say, many is more than one. He said, yes. He will guide you to all truth, all is more than one. He said, yes. I said, I want only one. Give me one new thing. And in 40 years, no Christian worth the name has been able to produce one. New thing. But Jesus Christ could not have given you in so many different words. Not one. I said, look, if we read this, we read this prophecy verse from the Bible with a little emphasis on the pronoun, I said, you will see that Jesus is not speaking about the ghost because they're talking about the Holy Ghost. Listen, Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. How we? When he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you to all truth. For he shall not speak from himself, but what things shall he hear, that shall he speak, and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come, he shall glorify him. Eight masculine pronouns in one verse. It ill befits a ghost. You agree? The ghost is spiritually hit. He, 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 he. Talking about a man, a man, a man, a man. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he guided mankind into all truth. Meaning all your problems, solution to all your problems, he gives you the answers. It might not go down well because you have grooved into a different type of behavior. It's difficult to get out of the groove. Groove, you know, groove, you get that groovy feeling in the groove, you know. And the difference in the, between the groove and the grain is only depth. How much the one is deeper than the other? Grain. In the grain. When you are there, nice, comfortable, groovy feeling. And when you want to get a guy out of that, it's very uncomfortable out of the group. So, they are grouped in into a certain form of behavior. But answers to your problems, the problem of surplus women, Islam gives you. The problem of alcoholism, Islam gives you the answers. Of gambling, Islam gives anything. Of racism, Islam gives you the answers. It might not go down well. 
he is a student through who guided mankind all through. Now also get another book from the Islamic Propagation Center International in Birmingham, what the Bible says about Muhammad. Look, you owe it to yourself. Free books, free literature. Get it for yourself. If you want more to send to your homeland, your motherland, then I hope you try and find out. So look, I want 50 copies to send to Indonesia or Malaysia or Bangladesh to my people. Find out how much does each copy cost. So it says you send pens each. Then if you want 100, send a thousand pens. You'll get them, you see? Send them to your country. But for yourself, absolutely free, all literature printed by the Islamic Propagation Center. What you might not be available there at the moment, write to South Africa and we'll send them now to you from there. Yes, yeah. Brother, uh, this is away, actually away from the subject that you talk. It's just as a matter of interest, since you are from South Africa. Uh, I saw some demonstration in the TV that Muslim brothers were uh, demonstrating and they were holding banners and uh, there were some motors of uh, Imam Khomeini about it. Could you possibly, it's interesting for me to see why is, uh, is it there? The Muslim in South Africa, we are less than 2% of the population. For every two Muslims, there are 98 non-Muslims in South Africa. We are less than 2%. But in the political struggle, more than 20% of the people who make sacrifices with their lives are Muslims. More than 20%. We are less than 2%, but we make more than 20% of the sacrifices. You never heard about uh, Imam Abdullah Harun. He gave his life in prison. Ahmad Habiji gave his life in prison. Ahmad Timur gave his life in prison. Dr. Yusuf Dadu had to flee for his life. Maulana Kachali had to flee for his life. No, you never hear about them. You only about Biko, Biko, Biko. So you think Biko is the man. The Muslims have you know, sacrificed more than 20% than any other people in the country. With regards to Imam Khomeini, uh, they are no Shias in South Africa. They are no Shias. All the people that I know, they are all Sunnis, whether of the Hanafi school of thought or the Shafi school of thought. Hanafi is the Shafi. There were no Malakis, no Hanbalis, no Shia. There are only Hanafis and Shafis. Most of the Malays from Malaysia and Indonesia, about half of the population are Shafis, and my people, most of us, are Hanafis from the Indo Pakistan subcontinent. Imam Khomeini has become the hero because in recent times, he is the only Muslim who have been standing up to the big shaitan, America. You see, he's the only one who has done it so far. So naturally, you know, the people feel that he's a hero and put that spirit in the land that we do, you know, we are small as we are, as few as we are, we can also stand up before the government. I think that is the spirit behind Imam Khomeini's program, if you saw it. Water in its form as water, ice, and steam. What's your comment on that? Uh, I think my sister must have been there at the Royal Good Hall. Uh, it's quite the Christian had given that as an example. We start tackling with everything that the fellow spoke. We would not have been able to deliver our own message, something that yet go to the heart of the Christian. So we have to keep away. We start analyzing each and everything that the guy speaks then you lost the opportunity of delivering your own message because we are all time bound by time. You speak for so many minutes and out. If you didn't deliver the message, you lost out. So, you see, if we have the time, you can ask the fellow. You say, it is like ice, water and vapor. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Ice, water and vapor. So, who is ice, who is water and who is vapor? So, we can, you know, our senses might come with the aid. He said, look, vapor and the Holy Ghost. You might say, well, you know, maybe the Holy Ghost is vapor. <laughs> then, who is the water? Is Jesus water? Is he water? Or is he ice? Is the Father ice? What is he? You know, most of them ridiculous. You see, they keep on just as if you know that they have proved the point. But I said, look, the whole thing is taken out of your book. The Bible. The verse in the Trinity, the whole thing is thrown out. So if this was a valid doctrine, if this was a valid doctrine, 
is why should it be taken out of the Bible? In every modern translation of the Bible, the verse on the Trinity, the clearest statement of the Trinity happens to be, in, as I mentioned then, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, for oh, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, standing for Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's the nearest, closest to the Holy Trinity. That verse is now expunged from all modern translations of the Bible as an interpolation, as a fabrication, as an adulteration. So if this was your valid doctrine, why is it thrown out? Allah tells us, Wala Tell them, tell them, don't say Trinity. In Tawu Khairullah, stop it. This is, it will be better for you. In Namallah, we love Why? For you, Allah is one Allah, is not three in one, is not one in three. Is the most nonsensical idea. Jesus Christ never preached it. Of course, it's only it's a subject by itself. I can teach you and explain to you the verses from the Bible when Jesus says that God is one. When he's asked by a learned man of the Jew, Master, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israel Adonai Rahainu Adonai Echad. It means here, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He didn't say three in one. Actually, uh, during my discussion with some uh, Christians, what I try to do, I try to, to direct them to the Quran. But what I find difficult really is to guide these people to Quran, they stubborn to read this Quran. What the, what is the secret behind it? Could you please clarify that? So the question was that our brother is finding a little difficulty in getting the Christian to approach the Quran. So he wants to know what is the secret, how, how do you do the job. See, in the Holy Quran, Allah Ta'ala describes the Jews and the Christians to us. He says, Kuntum khaira ummatin nas, that you Muslims are the best of people evolved for mankind. Ta'muruna bil ma'ruf wa ta'muruna bil munkar. Because you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. That's half a verse. The continuation is, Wa lau amana ahlul kitabi lakana khaira lahum. But if the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them, in other words, it will be better for you. Minhumul mu'minuna, among them there are good people. Mu'min! I do not want to give credit to them that there are mu'mins among them, and there are hardly any mu'mins among us. You know, we are Muslims. We say we have submitted, but Islam has not really entered our heart. The Bible calls us. But Allah says, Minhumul mu'minuna, among them, among the Jews and the Christians, there are mu'mins. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. So you have been coming across perverted transgressors. Now, there are ways. Allah is telling you that there is one group who is a moment, and there are others are perverted transgressors. Pasipun. So you have to treat them differently. But we assume that we are treating with the moment. Anytime you come across a man, we have to treat him as a moment. That should be the Muslim attitude. And to the moment, this is the way, among the Jews and the Christians. You can tell the Father. So you know we believe in Jesus. Tell you now like this, that we believe in Jesus. So what? Gentlemen, so what? He's thinking that you're trying to carry favor with him. You want something nice from him, maybe a chocolate or a cigarette, you want something. He said, you believe in Jesus. He's one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe he's the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth, which many, many modern day Christians don't believe today. Your own people, they don't believe that he was born miraculously. We believe that he gave back to the dead by God's permission. He used the born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We believe in all that. He's shocked. He's thinking that you're trying to carry favor with him. That you scratch his back, he'll scratch your back. You say a few good words about his Jesus, you might say a few good words about our Muhammad. That's what he's thinking. So he says, you know what Nanu says? No, in the book, the Quran. Where? Surah Ali Imran, the birth of Jesus. Starting with chapter 3, verse 42. Start. Start. 
as it is a textbook. If you want to commit incest, there are four different ways you can commit incest. You know what's incest? You know what is incest? How do you all know what is incest? You know what is incest? Huh? You see, when you cohabit with somebody else's wife or daughter, it is adultery, sinner. But when you do it with your own mother, when you do it with your daughter, when you do it with your own daughter-in-law, when you do it with your sister, that is called incest. Okay? Yes. Now you know, there are four different types of incest in the first book of the Bible alone. And this is a textbook. If you want to commit incest, four different ways you can do it. That is the book, the Bible. But we don't start with that. We start with all humility, Uru Vila Sadi, Rabbi Kadil Hikmati, Srivaya Gaur, with the ways of the Lord, with wisdom, Wal Mawarzatil Hasanati, and with beautiful preaching, Vashadil Hum Billati Ahsan, and wisdom gives them the ways that are best and most gracious. And I'm telling you how. Do it. But now if the guy starts being funny, clever, he wants to make things around you, you want to make a nest in your head, you want to be used as a punching bag, you want to be used as a doormat, don't allow you to do that. You give it to him, that he'll never darken a Muslim door again. You, you refer to the atheist to be better than the Christian, because he has made sense of what the Bible is. But the Holy Quran refers to the Christians and Jews as the evil of the book. So the Holy Quran uh, gives them some sort of special reference. So what's your comment to that? I'm not again saying that. Allah gives them that these are the fittest people to receive the message. You see, in the verse I quoted you, that Allah appoints us as the khayr of the the best of people, evolved for mankind. Your qualifications, that you enjoy what is right and you forbid what is wrong, and you believe in Allah. This honor is given to you by Allah. Allah gave it to you. 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 And the very first people with whom you must share this are the Jews and the Christians. Because they were prepared to receive this message. So, Allah gave it to you. Ya Ahlul Kitab, the Quran says again and again, Ya Ahlul Kitab, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, O people of the book, La Tablu Fi Dinikum, do not put back things in your religion, Ya Ahlul Kitab, Ta'ala, O people of the book, come. First address is to the Jews and the Christians. Right? You are addressing what is prepared to receive the message. Is the guy, I said, now in that there is resistance, there is prejudice. He's been programmed, the Christians, especially, and the Jew. The Jew that we are the chosen people. We are the children of Abraham. And we are the sons of David. We are the chosen people. They are programmed that way. So now this is a prejudice. This is who? Islam came through Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the son of Ismail. You know, Ismail was the son of a bond woman, a slave woman from Africa, Hajra. And now this prejudice is being cultivated. So in other words, the prejudices are greater. In the Jew and the Christian said, Look, we God, the veritable Son of God. He died for our son. God came down to earth as a man and he sacrificed his life. What do we need anything anymore? Prejudices are already cultivated. The atheist and the agnostic of the day, he has got no prejudice. He's got prejudice in general against religion, misconception that everybody has. He is against his own superstition. You tell him Rama is God? He says, Rubbish, what are you talking about? He says, Krishna is God, so what are you talking about? He says, Buddha is God, so what are you talking about? He says, Jesus is God, so what? A child born in the stable to a Jewish girl, circumcised on the eighth day, God, the maker of this universe, what's wrong with you? Are you a fool? Are you mad? If you were a nurse helping Mary when she was delivering the child, can you for one moment think that that is your God coming out of a woman's body? Hmm? With all the fruit on the mat and circumcised on the eighth day, your God? No, he's laughing at you if you said he's God. We also laugh at the same thing. No, how can God be circumcised? How can God be carried by a woman for nine months? He's on the same wavelength as you. I'm talking about the atheists and the agnostics of today. I'm not talking about the cartoon of the bushes of Makkah 1400 years ago. I'm talking about the modern man. His prejudices are different. His prejudice against religion because of all his superstition. So, we know over. Congratulate him, psychology, you psychology, come, come man, I'm one with you. I also don't believe in a God who walked in the garden. I don't believe in a God that Moses could see his backside. I don't believe in a, believe in a God that was born of a woman, that a woman carried him for nine months. So, I'm one with you. But he's God. What is this God? Start talking to him, explaining to him. Show him what Allah says, how he speaks in the Quran. 
He doesn't speak like that at all. He is not talking dogmatically, he is reasoning with you. كَيْفَ تَكْفُرُونَ بِاللَّهِ So how can you not believe in Allah? وَكُنْتُمْ أَمْوَاتًا Seeing that you were non-existent, you were dead, you were non-existent, فَأَحْيَاكُمْ And He brought you to life, ثُمَّ يُمِيتُكُمْ And He will cause you to die, ثُمَّ يُحْيِكُمْ And He will bring you back to life again, ثُمَّ يِلَيْهِ تُرْجَعُونَ And to Him will be your return. Reason. There was a time when there was no existence. This earth was a modern mass. No life could have ever, ever existed here. Yeah. Millions of years ago, no life, nothing. And over the years, millions of years, billions of years, according to you, according to the scientists, they start cooling and cooling. And after billions of years, years life originated in the sea. He says, but after billions of years, protoplasm, you know. I mean about whatever life started in the sea, in the water, in the ocean. That's what the Quran is telling you. Hey, what the Quran is telling you? Awalam yara lazina kafaru Se do not yet believe a sea The eight is an agnostic and they see Awalam yara lazina kafaru Anna samawati wal arda Kana tadatkan That the heavens and the earth be joined together As one unit of creation Fafatakna huma And he split them asunder Waja'alna min al-ma'i kulla shayin Hai! And he is made from water every living thing Afala yuminun Will you then not believe? Who? The Arabs? The Badoons? No! He's talking to you, the modern man, the man of science, man of learning, who says life originated in the sea, and yet you say there is no God. You talk to him. Where did this man get this from? That life originated in the water. You don't need interpretation. So, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَعِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيْ And it's made from water every living thing. أَفَلَا يُمِنُونَ Will you then not believe? Talk to him. Talk to him. Please. Inshallah, you will make a better headway with the atheists and the agnostics than the Christians and the uh, Jews. Yes, yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I'm sorry, Dad. I'm interested to know the difference in the side, different side of the Christianity. We know that in Christian there are Protestant, Catholic, Silver, Witnesses, and so on. Can I know the historical background? How the difference rise, and how can we gain from the from their differences? The question was: My son wants to know about the differences between the Christian sects. There are a thousand different sects and denominations among the Christians. A thousand. You want to know them all? <laughs> no, you don't need. You don't need. You don't need to know all this. Waste of time. The bulk of Christendom believes in the Bible as the word of God. Take the Bible away from him, meaning show him that this is not. If he comes to an argument, that is not the word of God. Whoever comes, to Jehovah's Witness, same Bible. See, there are variation in time translation. Don't worry. It basically is the same Bible. What I told you about the four types of incest in the first book. Is in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, is in the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, it is in the authorized, authorized King James version of the Bible. Every Bible in the world has it. This is pornography, the highest form of pornography. Ezekiel chapter 23. I can't quote it because my children, my daughters are here. Others are the children. It's banned in South Africa. They have banned verses of the Bible, not knowing that this was a Bible. Yes. Somebody sent a pamphlet with those verses from the Bible. Filthy, dirty thing. No decent man can read this to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even his fiance if she's a good woman. You can't read it. Filthy, dirty book. So, a, a new forward sister of ours, a white lady, I'm not a racist, a white girl. She carries some weight in her family. She's a white person, right? She with a white name. In the white area coming from there, carries more weight. She sent it to the censorship board that this thing here is horrible. You must do something about it, or you're going to take matters in your own hands. So the censorship board shows us, look, wait a minute, we will do something, and within two weeks, they banned it, all those verses. And every verse is word for word from the Holy Bible. Filthy, dirty book that the Christians themselves have banned in South Africa. So this is it, every book. You don't have to go into details about the Roman Catholics and the Protestants. There are the difference between the two, the Protestant world, whether it's a Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Church of England, the difference between them and the Roman Catholics is the difference between Tweedledum and Tweedledee. You heard that? Tweedledum and Tweedledee? You know when you were little children, you were little 
shows Angel Gabriel asking Mary, what time did you say Joseph gets back from his work? And the company refused to withdraw the cars from the market. So it's just showing you how those people are making fun from their religion, even to that extent. Um, the question from the sister's side was, about the reaction of Christians to your talks about Islam and about Christianity and is the Pope going to meet you as he promised? <laughs> <laughs> the reactions are always the same. There are people among the people of the Book of the Jews and the Christians who hear your point of view and they appreciate it. And there is a person among them, you'll find that he is exactly as the Quran says, perverted transgressor. And I'm telling you, these are the two types of people, you'll find them all the time. There is a good type of fellow, you know, sensible fellow, so, no, I can see your point of view, I can see your point of view, I can see your point of view. And there is another, no matter what you do, you can bring the moon down and put it in his hand, it won't work. So, this is a natural thing, but now for us is you go out and deliver the message. It is not for you to know what fruits you're going to get, what results. Because Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُزَكِّرْ So you, you deliver the message because it is your duty to deliver the message. لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِمُسَيْتِرْ Allah says that you will not be questioned regarding them إِلَّا مُنْ تَوَلَّ وَكَفَرْ Why they accepted or why they didn't accept, Allah won't ask you. He will only ask you, did you deliver the message? That's all. That's your job. You do your job. It's not for you to reason why. It is for you just to do or die. That's your job. Go out and do the job. Fruits, leave to Allah. Yusuf Ali, in one of his commentaries, poetic commentaries, he says, so fight the good fight. You know, put up a good shot. But dispute not about the prize, what you're going to get. That is for God to give. It's a man of faith, act and obey. Men of faith, you people who believe, act and obey. It is no better to fight for truth than to seek holy gain. The pure in faith, God will give the mind and the resources to conquer. He will give you the mind and the resources to conquer. They will fight with no thought of ever turning back. With that mentality, when you go forward, the victory is sure to come. So the victory should be ascribed to God, not men. Go out and do the job. Put up a good fight. Put up a good struggle. Don't worry about the prize. Also, the possibility about the meeting with the Pope. That was ah, the and this is Holiness the Pope. You see, he has been going out to Muslim countries. And when he went to Turkey, His Holiness the Pope, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Nigeria, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. When he went to Kenya, he said, we must have a dialogue with the Muslims. Who is this we? We. We. The Roman Catholic Church. What is the dialogue? Dialogue is a two-way process. Is that what he means? No. Actually, he's telling his people, go and convert the Muslims. They are already prepared to receive that message. Who are the Muslims? Look, the Muslim is the nearest to the Christian. You don't have to convince a Muslim that Jesus is the Christ. You don't have to convince a Muslim that he was born miraculously. You don't have to convince a Muslim that he gave you life to the dead by God's permission and he gave you those born blind in the level by God's permission. He believes! without any proof required. What he needs is a gentle push. Christianizing. Showing that Christ died for his sins. That is all. So he is prepared from the Christian point of view, from the Islamic point of view, we say Allah says the Jews and the Christians were prepared to receive this message. Now they are telling because you didn't do the job, they are saying now that the Muslim is prepared to receive our message. 
So dialogue, not dialogue is telling people don't convert them. But if you use the word convert, we are going to react. When you see this guy coming with his dog color in your home Sunday morning, Sarah is coming to steal your children. Get rid of him somehow. You know, this is get him out of the way. But if he comes along, he says, like to have a dialogue with you. He's holding this book, tells us we must talk with you. Have a dialogue with you. You can't say no. Because Allah tells us to have a dialogue with him. Kul, ya Allah, kitab, Allah. You have a dialogue with him. Allah tells you to have a dialogue with him. And if he's talking about dialogue, you can't say no. But you come our second best. Because you're not equipped. You're not trained for that. Our learned men are not trained for that. That is what he's telling me. So I lose the game. Because I'm in the game. So I write to him, I said, Your holiness, you are free for a dialogue, I am prepared to come along and have a dialogue with you. In St. Peter's in Rome, it's a huge place, I saw it. I said, I am prepared to come over any time that suits you. Time and date, tell me, I will come. We don't want to give you trouble to come to Africa, to the land of apartheid. No, no, we will come to your door at your convenience. No reply. So I sent him another letter. No reply. I sent him a telegram. No reply. I sent him another telegram. So he replies, he's prepared to receive me in the secretariat, in private. Now this is not a matter between Ahmadidat and the Pope. It's a matter between Islam and Christianity. The world must know what's going on. So we write back to him, we say, how big is your secretariat? Because there are three plain loads of young men. They want to charter planes from South Africa, from Durban, Johannesburg and Cape Town. They want to come for the dialogue. My brother in, in, in the UK, they want to come. My brother in the uh, Amiras, they want to come. I said, how big is your secretariat? No reply. Then another letter, no reply. You said, a telegram, no reply. How big is your secretariat? The TV networks of the world want to cover it. The news media of the world want to cover it. How big is the secretariat? No reply. So Allah Bari Ta'ala, he sends me, he makes somebody to send me a letter with a picture of the Pope. I don't know whether you've seen it. You know, <laughs> playing hide and seek. Did you see that? Yeah. Is it in my head? So that's the answer. You see, Allah Bari Ta'ala doesn't send Jibreel anymore. Jibreel is retired. You know that? Jibreel doesn't come anymore. If somebody tells you he watches, you need a psychiatrist for <laughs> He's retired, he's done his job. So Allah Paritara is still who is good. He's still working. He's not going to sleep. He's activating people. Somebody sent me the picture. I said, right, that's a message. He's playing hide and seek. So I printed four million of that. He's holding this place hide and seek with Muslim. That's my job with the Brothers, I know that many of you would like to ask questions, and many sisters have sent questions. But I'm afraid we have to take into consideration that Brother Ahmed Idad gave Jum'ah prayer khutbah today in Birmingham, and he traveled straight away to come here to ask to Darby to give us this lecture and to answer our questions. So I suppose you understand that he's tired, although he's willing to answer all your questions. So inshallah we would like to thank him very much for the effort he did and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him the help and the effort and keep him for us to work inshallah for his plan. So inshallah we close this session um, the sisters like to proceed to the dining hall, followed by the brothers. Shall we?